So hello, good morning. Um, this is the level five diploma in education and training. It's unit one, theories and principles of education and training. So the learning outcomes for this lecture are as follows. So number one is understand the theories and principles of learning and assessment when planning education and training. Number two, understand theories of behavior management in an education and training environment. And number three, understand how to apply theories and principles of learning and communication to education and training. So the assessment criteria, this is what you'll be assessed on when you have to write your essays about this topic for unit one. So I try to hit all these criteria, but you may find that you need to do some extra reading outside of this lecture. Well, you'll have to do that anyway, but make sure that you are reading about these assessment criteria. So explain the use of diagnostic assessments to identify learners' individual goals and preferences. Describe how to devise a scheme of work incorporating the needs of learners and internal and external requirements. Describe how to design education and training plans that incorporate the goals and needs of learners. Explain how to enable learners and others to provide feedback to inform inclusive practice. And finally, explain how planning inclusive teaching and learning considers learning, communication and assessment theories and principles. So that's the first part of today's lecture. So the aim of this unit is to provide you with the knowledge and understanding of theories, principles and models when applied to education and training. So how does learning occur? Well, people learn in different ways. You might know that already. So think back to when you first received your mobile phone or something else like an iPad. How did you learn how to use it? Did you read the instructions first? Did you ask someone to show you? or tell you how to use it? Or did you just pick it up and start using it without really thinking about it and just learn as you went? This is a really good indicator of how you learn best. And it's really good to think about that and reflect upon that because that will actually help you in your career if you know how you learn best. For example, I know that I learn best by reading something over and then having a discussion with a colleague about it. That really helps me to understand things more deeply. So learning preferences. There's an old Chinese proverb. I hear, I forget. I see, I remember. And I do, and I understand. So let's take a, a second to have a think about that. So when you hear lots of information, you may find it difficult to remember it all. When you're sitting in a lecture for hours on end and somebody's talking and talking, it's really difficult to listen and think about everything that they're saying let alone remembering everything they're saying. So if you see something taking place that represents what you hear, you should remember it more. However, if you actually carry out the task, you will understand the full process and remember how to do it again, because you've done it yourself. You've actually carried it out. The same applies to learners. Once they put theory into practice, they will begin to understand what they've learned. So most learners have a particular learning preference or style a way that helps them to learn. There's some questionnaires that you can search for on the internet, which learners can carry out to find this out. Or they might instinctively know what works for them. They might be already quite knowledgeable on what, how they learn best. One thing to look out for is the, um, the visual, what's it called? The visual audio kinesthetic learning styles because they've actually been proven to not be um, true. So watch out for that on the internet. So it's learning and um, preferences rather than learning styles. So let's move on to thinking about learning styles. So Honey and Mumford in 1992 suggested that learners are a mixture of the following four styles. So these are activist, pragmatist, theorist, and reflector. So have a think about those words before I start to describe what they are. And it's important to remember that we're not all one, one type of uh, learning style. We are, some of us might be a mixture of all four, some of us might be two. So yeah, activists, they learn by doing. Theorists, as it suggests, they like to understand the hypothesis behind activities. So they like models, ideas, and truths with a specific end goal. So pragmatists, these people know how to perceive, how to put learning into practice in their present reality. So that means thinking about their learning and going, oh yeah, so I know how to do that. At the moment, I can 
I can learn how to uh, fix a car and then I can go and drive my, I can go and, I can go and fix my car that's in the driveway and then I can go and drive it. So reflectors, these people learn by watching and contemplating what happened. They want to remain back and see encounters from various alternate points of view. They like to gather information and use the opportunity to work towards a suitable conclusion. So it's fine to think about these learning styles, but we need to think how we're going to put them in action. So activists, they prefer things like problem solving, group discussion. Theorists, they like statistics, stories, quotes. Pragmatists, they like case studies. They like problem solving. They also like discussion. And reflectors, they like first-hand information and they like to think about situations from different perspectives. That's what helps them to learn. So then we go from learning styles to thinking about different styles of teaching and learning. We need to get these different learning styles into the classroom. So formal teaching is known as pedagogy. That's where the teacher directs all the learning, for example, in a lecture. Informal teaching is known as andragogy. Did I say that right? <laughs> andragogy, where the learner is the focus, for example, via group work and discussions. So pedagogy does not always allow for individual knowledge to be taken into account. And it often focuses on teaching the same topic at the same time to all learners. So just think about that for a minute. Is that, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? So then we move on to Bloom 1956 and his domains of learning. He stated that learning goes through five stages which can affect a person's actions, thinking and emotions. And these are known as psychomotor, cognitive and affective. So when teaching your subject, you'll need to consider which domain you want to reach, or indeed, if you want to reach more than one. And this is uh, one of Bloom's domains here on the right, the triangle. So you can have a quick read over that. So we've got receiving, responding, valuing, organizing, and characterizing. So here's Bloom's five stages of learning. Attention, perception, understanding, short-term memory, and a change in behavior. So once the learning has been successful, a change in behavior occurs. So as a teacher, if you observe a change in behavior, then you know that the learning has taken place. So that might come across in different ways. It might be a sense that the students are not uh, struggling with the task that you've given them. All of a sudden they, they understand and they manage to carry the task out easily. Maybe they learn something that makes them change their behavior in the outside world. So think of psychomotor as the hands um, the skills, the cognitive as the head, the knowledge and the understanding, and affective as the heart, so as the attitudes. So the hands, so that we're thinking about practical uh, learning, hands-on skills. The cognitive as the knowledge and understanding, so that's the kind of theory. And affective, that's the kind of emotional feeling that we have towards our learning. and Bloom. He also came up with Bloom's taxonomy. This is quite famous nowadays. So at the bottom we have remember, so that's kind of the most basic form of learning, just being able to recall facts, and basic concepts. And then we move upwards through the triangle to understanding, and then we can apply that understanding. And then the ability to analyze information, draw connections amongst ideas, and then evaluate, to look back on what we've done and say whether we could have done something differently, we could have done something better. If we did it next time, how would we change it? And then at the top, we've got creativity, creating something, a new or original piece of work. You can design something, assemble something, construct something, develop something different. That's at the top of the taxonomy. So when you're planning lessons, you need to be thinking about all these um, domains in the taxonomy. Are you hitting some of them or all of them every lesson? What do you want to be hitting in a lesson? 
So then we move on to Gagne's conditions of learning in 1985. He suggested that there are several different types or levels of learning. And each different type requires different types of teaching. So he identified five major conditions of learning. So they were verbal information, intellectual skills, cognitive strategies, motor skills, and finally attitudes. So in addition to that, the theory outlines nine events that activate the processes needed for effective learning to take place. So we need to, as teachers, gain their attention. That's number one, because if they're not, if they're not um, concentrating, if they're not giving you their attention, they can't possibly learn anything. So number two, informing learners of the objective. So that's just telling them what they're going to be learning during that um, period, of uh, period of learning. Number three, stimulating recall of prior learning. So going back to what they might have learned before and then linking it to the new learning. That's also known as retrieval. Number four, presenting the stimulus. Number five, providing learning guidance. So that might be um, handing out a worksheet, making sure that you have the instructions on the board for them to see. Number six, eliciting performance. So you're showing them what you expect them to do. Number seven, providing feedback, telling them if they've got it correct, telling them if, if they're doing it well. Number eight, assessing their performance. So again, um, constantly reinforcing that they, they've got it correct. And if they haven't got it correct, going over it with them again, assessing their performance constantly. And number nine, enhancing retention and transfer. So that might be go going over the information as many times as you can during a lesson at the beginning and then in the middle with the actual learning taking place. And then with your plenary at the end of the lesson, you might want to quickly summarize the main objectives of the lesson. And then you might want to check that they understand what the objectives were. Gagne believed all teaching and learning sessions should include this sequence of events. So it's quite a lot to remember when you're planning a lesson. So sensory theory. So Laird in 1985 stated that learning occurs when the five senses of sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste are stimulated. And Laird's theory suggests that if multi senses are stimulated, then more learning will take place. So there's sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste at the bottom there. So I just want you to take five minutes and I want you to think about how you would use all the five senses to aid learning for your subject. And then we'll, we'll have a think about it together and I'll just give you a couple of minutes, okay? Okay, so you can share your ideas via the chat, or if you would like to, you can put your mic on right now. So how can you use all five senses to aid learning for your subject? Okay, so no ideas at the moment. Um, so I'll tell you some of mine. So I actually teach science um, two days a week. So using the five sciences, uh, the five senses in learning from my subject science. So that is, um, well, we have, I'm lucky that we have a practical subject. So I get to do experiments with the, the pupils, with the learners. Um, so when I'm describing what could be happening during a practical lesson, 
I'm asking them to observe what's happening. I'm asking them to look really carefully for color changes for anything that might happen. I'm asking them to listen as well, just in case there's any noises being given off in a, in a chemical reaction, for example. Um, so that's that's um, some way of focusing on those um, is a good way of bringing in the five senses to aid learning. I wonder how you could do it in different subjects. I think maybe in English literature, you could talk about how you feel when you read text. Can you imagine what that person in, in the story is thinking or feeling or smelling or tasting? So yeah, some good, some good thinking to get on with there using the five senses. So we, then we move on to learning theories. So we've got our learning styles. So we know how people learn. Now we need to think about how to teach them in order to be the best that we can to teach them according to their style. So Cobb in 1984 proposed a four stage experiential learning cycle by which people understand their experiences and as a result, modify their behavior. It's based on the idea that the more often a learner reflects on a task, the more often they have the opportunity to modify and refine their efforts. The process of learning can begin at any stage and is continuous. There's no limit to the number of cycles which can be made in a learning situation. So experiential learning. So it, it's kind of how it sounds. It's, it's giving the learners an opportunity to have an experience in their learning. So they'll have that experience and then they'll have the opportunity to observe that experience. And then you might ask them to reflect on that experience. What happened? What did they learn from it? What changed? You then move on to the theory of that, um, that experience, that observation. And you, tell, you teach them the, the abstract concept behind it. You can then get them to experiment again, either in the same period of time or later on. And there's no, um, there's no stopping to that cycle. You can keep going with it. So I'd like you to take five minutes, or actually take a little bit longer, to watch these two clips. And I want you to compare the two clips and think about what you noticed that was different about the classroom, the learners, and the language that was used by the teachers, because they're both extremely different. So can you do this now?
So Pike showed that over a period of three days, learners remember 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, and 70% of what they say, but 90% of what they say and do. So something else to be mindful of when you're planning lessons. Oh, hi, you've returned. I was wondering where you'd gone. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. So have a think about what activities could you use for your subject to help ensure that your learners remember what they've been taught. This is the key point about teaching. If you stand at the front of the class and talk, talk, talk for a period of time, is that the most efficient way for your learners to remember what they've been taught? I'll give you one minute to have a think about that. Okay, so you can write some messages in the chat and I can respond. But uh, when you're thinking about activities in a classroom, you need to think about having lots of different activities to ensure that you're including all different learning styles for a start, but also that you're keeping the lesson moving, you're keeping it dynamic, you're keeping it active, and you're ensuring that the, le the learning objectives are being um, remembered by the learners. So that means maybe having a card sort to go over some information that you might just have taught. It means maybe asking the learners to summarize some of the information they've been given. Maybe even draw a picture and label it. Um, all, all those types of activities. But we'll be thinking about a bit, uh, a bit more about that in a minute. So Rogers in 1983 and others developed the theory of facilitative learning. So this is based upon a belief that people have a natural human eagerness to learn and that learning involves changing your own concept of yourself. This theory suggests that learning will take place if the person delivering it acts as a facilitator. So that means, what does facilitator mean? Let's think about that. It means somebody who is, um, helping you to learn is maybe learning with you rather than an authoritarian figure at the front of the classroom. Facilitative learning. So thinking about learning theories, this is a very famous one, behaviorism. And Skinner in 1974 believed that behavior is a function of its consequences. So your learner will repeat the desired behavior if positive reinforcement follows. Your learner should not repeat the behavior if negative feedback is given. Giving immediate feedback, whether positive or negative, should enable your learner to behave in a certain way. So behaviorism um, is the idea that the teacher is um, instrumental in the learning and um, the the learner is there to be filled up with information from the teacher. The teacher is the giver of the information and is in charge of the classroom. And it's very teacher-centered learning. It's also based on the ideas of Pavlov and a Russian psychologist who carried out lots of exper experiments with animals. And he found that um, if you repeated behaviors over and over again, if they did something bad, you gave them something negative if they did something good you followed it up with um, positive reinforcement positive feedback then that changed the animal's behavior over time it's based on that principle so i don't know if you've heard about this before but what do you think about what do you understand by the words active learning and i've, I've put some i put a box there for you to think about so passive learning could be something like watching a video lecture, whereas active learning is watching a video lecture, but with guided notes. So maybe something, maybe an activity, something to fill in, something, some questions to answer. So have a little think, what do you, what do you understand by the term active learning?
Do we think that um, Skinner's behaviorism, do we think that that encourages active learning or passive learning? We'll come back to that later. So Piaget, on the other hand, had the idea of cognitism, cognitivism. Cognitivism focuses on what happens in the mind, such as thinking and problem solving. It emphasizes human cognition. It emphasizes the need to build new knowledge upon uh, prior knowledge and that learners need active participation in order to learn. You can observe changes in behavior, but only as an indication of what is taking place in the learner's mind. Then we move on to the idea of constructivism, which was thought of by Vygotsky. And constructivism states that learning is an active contextualized process of constructing knowledge, not just acquiring it. So not just passively being able to regurgitate information. It means that everybody has their own way of constructing that knowledge in their mind for them to understand understand it in a personal individualized way. So the learner brings past experiences and cultural factors to that learning situation. So nobody can understand how anybody else is going to learn something because nobody is another person. You bring your own past experiences and cultural factors to any learning situation. So each learner therefore has a different interpretation and construction of the knowledge process. And then we move on to Dewey, who was a famous American 20th century educationalist. And he, his idea was pragmatism. That places the learner as the focus, not the teacher in the classroom. So it's sometimes referred to as learner-centered education. And using different delivery approaches combined with practical activities, it helps to meet the needs of learners and reach all the different learning preferences. So learners should learn more from being guided rather than from being told what to do to having authoritarian instruction. So the teacher is seen in this, in this idea, in this theory as being the person who guides, who scaffolds activities and helps the learners to learn rather than instructing the learners to learn. So now we're managing to hit assessment criteria three. Explain how to design resources that promote equality and value diversity. Analyze the need for flexibility and adaptability in the use of inclusive education and training approaches and resources. Explain how to communicate with learners and others to meet learning needs and encourage progression. Explain how delivery of inclusive teaching and learning incorporates theories and principles of learning and communication. So when we're thinking about planning lessons for learners, we need to think about planning in terms of a whole term or half a term or a topic maybe. And we call that a scheme of work. So a scheme of work is a document that you can use to structure the teaching, learning and assessment of your subject. It needs to be logical. It needs to be progressive over several sessions. But it shouldn't be rigid. It should be flexible enough to allow for any changes. It should be flexible enough to say, well, I'm not sure if my learners achieved the learning objectives in that lesson. We'll need to go back to that information in the next lesson and ensure that they've met those learning objectives. So that means it needs to be flexible. So if you meet your learners for one session rather than a series of sessions, it won't be a scheme of work, it will be a lesson plan. So this is an example of planning a scheme of work. So as you can see, you have to know the number of sessions and you need to know the aim of the program. So you can put your dates all on the left. And you need to have your learning outcomes or objectives very clearly set out for each lesson. And during each lesson, during each each lesson, I would suggest a maximum of three learning objectives or outcomes, depending on the age group, but you don't want to be overloading uh, learners with um, lots of learning objectives. So you want to always be thinking about in your lessons, teacher activities versus learner activities. Is it mostly teacher activities or is it mostly learner activities? 
So always have that balance in your lesson. So it's not, it becomes more learner centered rather than teacher centered. And then you want to be thinking about the activities related to the learning. How many are there? Are they good at assessing the learning that's been happening? And then you need to also think about the resources that you're going to need for that, those lessons. Is it books? Is it iPads? Is it practical equipment for maybe electronics or science? Or is it taking the learning out of the classroom to observe things in nature, to discuss things in a different environment? So this is a good way of capturing all those ideas into one sheet. So the influences upon the content include thinking about the requirements of the qualification, thinking about your learner needs, thinking about the environment, the facilities, and also the resources that you have available to you. Thinking about how aspects of the learning will be assessed. Do they have an exam at the end of their qualification? Do they have lots of tests um, periodically through the scheme of work? Is it a big exam? Is it practical work perhaps? So thinking about all these things. Think about your learner's age range. Think about all their abilities. Think about what they might have done already. Think about the prior knowledge they might have. And think about particular needs that individual learners might have in your class. Try to always think about being inclusive. Think about differentiation. Differentiation is thinking about different modes of learning, but incorporating the same learning for everybody. So everybody should be learning the same things, but maybe some people need some extra support. So how can you achieve that? Some ways of differentiating can be providing a template of writing so that they don't need to write uh, massive paragraphs of writing out. They can fill in some blanks perhaps to uh, recap the learning. Maybe you could spend extra time sitting with a pupil if, they, if you can see that they're struggling or if, if you know that they struggle with particular learning or particular activities, making sure that you're around. Inclusivity. So that's making sure that everybody feels like they're part of the learning. There's nobody being left out. If you're doing group work, make sure that everybody is included in a group and make sure that everybody is participating in a group. So aspects to consider when you're planning a session. So the overall topic aim. So that's what you expect your learners to achieve during the session. Objectives, how your learners will achieve your aim. <clears throat> so thinking about the group composition, you need the details of the individual learners. You need their needs and you need to be able to um, think about the differentiation to take place. And you need to think about you as a teacher, what are your activities going to be? What will you be doing when they're writing, when they're listening? Use a variety of theory and practical approaches so that you can increase their learning opportunities and help to retain their motivation. I am pretty sure that whichever class you're ever going to teach, they're not going to be happy if you stand at the front of the class and you talk and talk and talk for a whole hour they're not gonna be motivated to learn by the end of the 55 minutes. It's not possible. You need to be thinking about your lesson in chunks, breaking it up into sections. So technically your learners should not be doing any activity for say longer than um, 15 minutes maximum, I would say. Because if you're helping them to stay motivated, then you're helping the behavior to stay good in your lesson, which will help them to learn. And it'll also ease the stress for you. So learner activities, what your learners will be doing and for how long? How will you keep them active and interested? How will you ensure inclusion and differentiation? Do you have spare activities, for example, in case some learners finish before others? Is there anything you could take out or, or cut down on if you run out of time? This is the idea of being flexible again. Sometimes lessons don't go to plan. Sometimes the learners learn really fast. Sometimes they learn a bit slower. You need to be able to adapt your lesson as it goes. Cut things out, add things in. Making sure that everybody's working all the time. Some learners will finish before others, making sure that they've got an extra activity to, to do while the other ones are finishing their activity. 
and also assessment activities. How are you going to assess the learning that's taking place? You need to be constantly assessing throughout the lesson, at the beginning of the lesson, throughout the lesson, the end of the lesson. And thinking about your resources. So what do you need to effectively deliver your session? Before the lesson, do you need to check the equipment is working? Or do you need to think about something in advance? Do you need to book a computer room? Do you need to book laptops? Do you need to think about the equipment you need and you need to go and ask another department to lend you that equipment? Do you have another plan in case something goes wrong? One of the biggest problems that we have sometimes is that the computer systems just go down and we don't have access to PowerPoint, to any of our online drives. So what are you going to do if that happens to you? Do you have a plan? Can you teach your lesson without having um, your PowerPoint available, for example? Do you have adequate notes printed out or written out that you can read from? So this brings us on to teaching, learning and assessment activities. So you need to engage, motivate and include your learners throughout your session. So this means needing to use varied teaching and learning activities to stop your learners becoming bored, lose concentration or become disruptive. And then going back to thinking about assessment again. So these activities should ensure that you can assess that learning has taken place. So when communicating with learners, this should be at the right level and appropriate for the subject. So informal assessment. So this is the assessment that takes place through your session. So that's things like asking questions and observing what's happening in your classroom. Do you feel like your learners have achieved the learning objectives? Informal activities assess ongoing progress and they usually be created and assessed by you. And this is called formative assessment. So there are actually quite a lot of good uh, websites that help with formative assessment. So one of them is called Kahoot. So you can actually um, make a quiz, for example, and you can focus it on what you have been doing in your lessons. And there can be multiple choice questions and you can have your learners log in as individuals, or you can do um, group quizzes as well, and they can carry out the quiz in your class. And then you can actually download an Excel spreadsheet with all their, um, with all their, their grades on there, the percentages of what they, they got from each question, from each quiz. So you can actually assess their level of knowledge on each topic that you might be learning at any given time. So that's a really good way of assessing them in an informal way. It just, just lets you know who, who is understanding which topic at which time. And then we move on to more formal assessment. So that's something like an assessment as, as, and uh, an assignment or an exam. So formal assessment is something that usually counts towards the achievement of the qualification. And formal assessment is known as summative assessment. And it's also important for these assessment activities to be fit for, perfect, fit for purpose. And they should also always be achievable by the learners. So what do we mean by that? We mean that the learners have had access to all the information and learning that they need to do well in their summative assessment. Learner feedback. So gaining feedback from your learners throughout a session will help you adjust the session accordingly to ensure that all learners are included and that learning is taking place. Obtaining feedback from learners will help inform inclusive practice. It shouldn't just be at the end of the session or programme. It should be an integral part of each session to enable you to include and involve all your learners. So during a session, some ideas, you can use open questions with individual learners. So an open question is when you ask a question that doesn't have one answer. So for example, an answer that has yes or no is a closed question. And an open question is something where learners feel like they can describe and explain um, their understanding. Um, you can use voting and interactive technology like the one I mentioned. And after a session, you can get learners to complete evaluation forms. You can get them to complete surveys and questionnaires. You can also um, get them to give verbal or written or electronic feedback. And you can do that in quite simple ways at the end of the lesson. You can get them to hold up their hand and say, 
Um, if you feel like you hit all the success criteria of this lesson, can you give me a five? If you feel like you didn't hit any of the success criteria, it's a one. And that's a really you know, simple, fast, effective way of obtaining feedback from learners about your lesson. So let's take a few minutes to think about what does an inclusive, safe learning environment mean to you? So for me, a safe, inclusive learning environment, I take that to mean that the teacher is um, think, put, putting the needs of the learners first. So the teacher isn't grumpy, the teacher isn't angry, the teacher isn't shouting, the teacher is listening to the learners and trying to meet their, their individual needs as best that they can. So that leads us on to your learning environment, the physical, social and learning aspects of learning. So an environment has three aspects. It has the physical aspect, social aspect and the learning aspect. So physical, that's the room and the resources that you have available. And they should always be appropriate and they should be safe. So always try to ensure that the seating arrangements are appropriate. So for you, that might mean having your learners sitting in groups around a table, or you might prefer to have them sitting in rows. Um, enable access to learning resources. They should have access to, to um, drinks and regular breaks for snacks and, and uh, lunch. They should have access to toilet facilities. They should also be warm. So always check your heating or your cooling if you're in a hot country. Um, making sure that you have adequate lighting. I, I remember being at school when I was little and being in classrooms that were really quite dark, especially during the winter time. And also having access to ventilation, keeping a window open. 
if there's not enough oxygen going around, you're going to have lots of sleepy learners. And social. So your learners should know that you, their peers and others, if necessary, will make their time supportive and productive. So creating an atmosphere where all your learners can work together comfortably. And having those rules put in place where learners know their expectations, they know the language that they should be using with each other, that they need to behave in a respectful manner towards you as the teacher and towards the other learners. And then there's the learning. So your session should always have a clear aim and it should convey how your learners will be supported towards achievement. So that means setting clear targets. It means going regularly over the material, recapping regularly, being in encouraging, motivating them, and also regularly praising your learners. It's something that gets overlooked time and time again. Constant positive reinforcement, praise what they're doing, tell them when they're doing something well. That will help them in turn to, mo to give them motivation to learn more. So assessment criteria two. So we're moving on to analyzing the theories of behavior management, explaining how to ensure a safe and inclusive learning environment. We've already touched on that. And explain how your own practice takes account of theories of behavior management. So learner behavior. So learners should demonstrate appropriate behavior when they are attending sessions, not only towards their peers, but towards the teacher and others in the organization. So we were thinking about that five minutes ago when we were talking about our classroom. Learner behavior is so important in your classroom. If you don't have good behavior, you will not have any learning happening. Oh. Two seconds. Okay, we're back on. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, no, hold on. Oh, yeah, it isn't. Okay, that's fine. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, we're on to behavior management theories. So most commonly applied since the 1950s is the applied behavior analysis, the ABA. And that involves the application of the principles of operant conditioning which we already touched on earlier by Skinner in 1953. So that's the idea that if someone does something right, then you praise them. And if they do something wrong, then you um, give them a sanction. So these ideas can be school-wide. Um, they can be just in your classroom or they can be individually focused. So you might have some pupils in your classroom who are particularly difficult with their behavior. So you, you they might have an individualized plan in place. And um, for example, checking in with you at the beginning of the lesson, and then you need to write a short report for them at the end of the lesson, just to um, let other teachers know how their behavior has been. Or it can just be a school-wide policy, for example, um, having learners come to your lesson prepared with their pen, um, not wearing their jacket inside the room, and making sure that they're not using any language that's inappropriate. So that's kind of a school-wide um, idea. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, he introduced this in 1960. Um, he rejected the idea that human behavior was determined by childhood events. He felt that obstacles should be removed that prevent a person from achieving their goals. And he argued that there are five principles and practices of teaching and training needs, which represent different levels of motivation, which must be met. So at the top, we've got the highest level, which is self-actualization. I am achieving what I wanted to. And this means that people are fully functional. They possess a healthy personality and they take responsibility for themselves and their actions. So at the bottom, physiological, so this is one of their needs that needs to be met. Is the learning environment comfortable? Am I thirsty, hungry, tired and cold? Do I feel safe? Am I at danger? Do I belong here? Do the others in my, my class respect me? 
And self-esteem, am I learning something useful? So I don't know, do you need to think about this for yourself and what it means to you? I think these are all very interesting um, principles and I agree with them in theory, but in practical life, I'm not sure that they carry over because you as the teacher are not in charge of what, hap what happens in a learner's home, whether they're coming to school hungry or cold or tired or stressed. Um, but we, we do have control over our classroom, so we can provide a safe environment while they're in school. We can also provide respect and self-esteem, and we can always try to help them to achieve what they want to achieve. And that, that level of achievement is different for every single person. So some people, it will be getting 90% in a test. For some children, it will literally just be coming into school and getting through the day without feeling... Um, a certain way without feeling scared or stressed or worried. Um, so everybody has um, difficult, uh, different achievements. So helping them to achieve what they want um, is at the top of the hierarchy of needs. So moving on from the needs, from the hierarchy of needs. The Equality Act in 2010 in Britain, that replaced all previous anti-discrimination legislation and it put it all into one act for England, Scotland and Wales. So this was so important and fundamental in education because it meant that there was equality for learners and it was their right to have fair access to, um, to education, to attend and participate in their chosen learning programme. So everybody has the right to um, have access to education. It also means that diversity is about valuing and respecting the differences in people, regardless of their ability and or their circumstances or any other individual characteristics they may have. So it's fundamental um, in our classrooms today that everybody has access to learning and that uh, we value everybody's differences and abilities So some examples of um, classroom rules for behaviour. So Karen and Clemens in 2007 said that clear, simple rules and expectations, which are consistently and fairly applied, they will participate towards better behaviour in the classroom. Fudge et al, for example, in 2008, found that the use of colour-coded rules and a matching signalling system to show which rules are in effect at any given time provided pupils with an easy guide to which standards of behaviour applied to their assigned activity. So that's just two examples of some things from the literature which will help with your behaviour in your classroom. So respecting others, saying nice things or nothing, look at the teacher during instructions, try to always listen, um, solving problems responsibly, so considering other people's feelings, managing yourself, you must stay in your seat during a lesson, that's basic. But some, some learners just uh, will have a tendency to wander around the room. So these are just basic rules and, and making them clear at the beginning of uh, your relationship with those learners is very important because you're setting the standards, what you expect in your classroom. So then we're moving on to positive behavioral management. So this is the idea that, um, as Bulger et al said, that teachers can begin to establish a positive learning environment by showing their passion for the subject matter, using students' names, reinforcing student participation during class and being active in moving among the students. So take a minute to think about what that means to you, being positive. So I think for me, it means not using negative language, trying not to raise your voice, trying not to tell learners off all the time and focus uh, when you want to tell someone off, uh, not saying it all the time, not saying it every five minutes, maybe just saying it uh, once or twice. Um, uh, giving them praise for when they do something correctly, so important. 
And instead of focusing on negative things, post, uh, focusing on positive things. So you might have a learner who's, who's quite difficult with their behavior and often does annoying things, maybe break some rules. How are you going to get around that? How are you going to help to make their behavior better? Well, how about focusing on when they do um, some really good work, giving them extra praise, and then the next lesson, following it up by spending a bit more time with them in the lesson, making sure that they're doing their work and then giving them yet more praise. And then they start to associate school with, um, with positive language, with being praised for what they're doing, rather than constantly hearing negative words said to them. So here's some ideas of positive reinforcement. So reinforcement is about increasing and maintaining behavior. So it's adding pleasant stimulus to the classroom. It's removing a, um, aversive stimulus. So removing something that's negative. So that's in complete contrast to the way that we usually think about um, behavior management in school. We normally think about punishments. So um, on the contrast with um, non-positive reinforcement. So we usually um, take something good away to decrease behavior. So we'll say something like, if you don't stop talking in my lesson, um, I'm gonna take away your break time. You'll have to stay inside for your break time. Um, and that's and that's the total opposite of positive reinforcement. So if you carry on uh, with the punishments, if you if you remove good things for the students in order to make their behaviour better, is that is it going to work in the long term, or are the students going to end up feeling frustrated, annoyed, angry, and maybe that's just going to perpetuate their their cycle of bad behaviour. OK, so I'm just going to give you 10 minutes to watch this video. And this video um, features Bill Rogers, who is known as a bit of an expert on classroom behaviour. Um, he's written lots of books, one of which is called Classroom Behaviour, a practical guide to effective teaching, behaviour management and colleague support. So you might want to look that one up. It's got some really good tips on how to help behaviour in your classroom. So as you watch the video, can you decide which strategies you would prefer to use? and which learning theories or behavior management theories they relate to.
Okay, so then we move on to thinking more about equality and diversity. So combined together, equality and diversity will help embrace learners' experiences, cultures and differences. And that should help enable each individual's maximum potential to be achieved in a safe and positive learning environment. In a diverse and multicultural society, recognising and accepting individual differences is part of embracing equality and diversity. So you need to think about that in terms of what it means for your classroom. So this has been quite a short um, summary of learning theories and learning styles and thinking about inclusive and diverse classrooms. So in order to have deeper understanding of all these theories yourself, you might want to do some further research. And this website here has got quite a good summary of all the learning theories that we've looked at today. And when you're looking at them, you might realize that some of them are quite similar, but that they use a lot of different terminology. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different terminology around in education at the moment. So it's very important to understand all the different terminology and, and which theory they correspond to in particular. So here's a quick summary quiz. Have a go at that. Question one, Pike stated that in studies, learners remember 10% of what? And you can just write it down or just think of the answer in your head. Which theorist divine, uh, devised domains of learning? So this is our way of checking your learning today. So if you come across a question where you think, well, I can't really remember that. So then you need to spend the time to go and look it up and think about it. And what five aspects are in the sensory theory? And number four, what is Kolb's cycle called? Number five, summarize the main ideas about behavior management. I really want you to take maybe a minute to think about the main ideas that you've taken away about behaviour management today. Okay, and I've included a quick reading list here. I think maybe some of them are missing, but that's a good overview. So if you want to quickly jot down any of these books, quite often um, there are lots of websites that have summarized these theories. So you, you can look them up if you want to have a quick read, quick understanding. So this is the man I was mentioning um, regarding learning styles, Fleming in VARC strategies. So I've left that in there so that you can maybe have a look for yourself. But that those theories have actually been debunked, as we say. They have been proven to be wrong. So that's your visual audio. I can't remember what R is, kinesthetic learning styles. So if you hear them mentioned in any education terms, ignore it. <laughs> okay, and finally, oh, I think I've got another page actually, yeah. Okay, so moving on, last page, I think. So we've got Kolb there, Pike and Skinner.
Okay. And some websites as well. You might want to click quickly link um click on them. So I think something I didn't touch upon was um the contrast between behaviorism and constructivist classrooms. So you might hear them referred to as um, traditional for uh, behaviorism um, versus progressive for constructionism, constructivism even. Um, so yes, you might so look out for that when you're you're reading about these theories. And there we are. So that brings us to the end of the lecture. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, I'll give you one more minute to uh, write any questions that you might have. Okay, well, if there's no questions, um, have a lovely rest of your day, and I hope that that was interesting and informative. Okay, bye bye.